Hi everybody, Bobby Ogilvie, Project Manager and Professional Coach. Today's question, what is the biggest gap startup founders, startup CEOs tend to have? Um, there's a lot of gaps, a lot of great strengths too, but um, if you think about what is required to start and found a company, uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of initiative. Um, it's a lot of being able to take risks, do things on your own, take control, take command, um, quickly do things, be decisive, um, be be kind of influential and charismatic, right? And those same qualities which help kind of out of nothing spawn this crazy idea, you know, hopefully noble, noble but crazy, right? Uh, you know, worthwhile but so tenacious or ambitious or absurd that it's, you know, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. Um, the same qualities which help get that, you know, out into the world can also then become a hindrance to, to growth and operations. Um, and let me just clarify what I, what I mean by that. Um, so, you know, when you study this, um, in an OD and organizational design class, you know, they talk about the four stages organizations go through and they're very much um, size bounded and Les McEwen talks about the same thing, breaks into seven stages, which is really just the four stages and then the three transition states between the, the four stages, right? Same thing. And um, so the, the gap that I'm talking about here, I would say it's, it could be as small scale as the small to medium size jump. So you know, in Canada, I think what we call small firms is 50 people or less. Large firm or medium firms is, I think, 50 to 500. And then large is above 500. I think in America, it's, it's a bit bigger the way they define that. But the gap is really that they're the CEO's, how can I put this gently, relationship to power is no longer helping their organization. It's holding them back. And... You know, personally, they resist becoming process oriented and following rules. Um, it's it can also be you know at a more ill or neurotic level that you know their strengths have already been granted to the organization, right? They help get them this far, or they've already kind of the 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 boons that come with their strength have already helped things, right? And it's like their weaknesses keep creeping up. Their what got you here won't get you there. And now the fact that they break rules and risk take in their own organization is more self-destructive. And particularly if you think about, you know, the, the people and processes around them, right? Um, if you think about what holacracy is trying to do and you, you know, you commit to this constitution, you have better ways of running, you know, tactics and operations, you know, you can, you have governance meetings, you have ways to bring up tensions and, just, and change policies and change rules, uh, that is a radically different way of organizing power, and that can be very hard for a lot of founders or executives to handle because they're used to, just on a very personal level, having power, as well as even more you know, in terms of, let's say, roles or what they're used to thinking their value add is. It's like, what? I don't get to be some manager or director and, and have like have all this, like, that's how I add value. Look, I need to have that authority. It's like, one, you actually don't need to. It's It's... You don't add as much value as you think. There are there is are good reasons why you might want to be this coordinator or the person in charge of this decision or whatever. But those are more specific roles than like. But I need to have a team of twenty people under me, or you know, fifty people under me, or else I'm not important. Well, that's not that's your own stuff you got to work on. Um, and all all the other kind of um, dysfunctions that can come with uh, someone that now needs to have some regard for bringing out the best in the whole organization right um that's that can be a really big shift for some people um you, i think the evidence also shows that uh firms that get um equity financing you know vc financing they are more likely to have ceo succession ship like as in ceo is made to leave and they get a new one in um from from the original founder and if you think of why that's happening is that at at some point to continue scaling and growing or doing what they want to do, the initial startup founder doesn't have the skills necessary and probably has other weaknesses holding them back. And then there's another different set of skills and resources and things which are needed to go from, you, know, you got from A to B, now you're going from B to C. This is not the leader that does that. Or or you could think of it as that leader needs to change. 
Um, and that way I'm a big believer in, in human potential and change. So this would also be a realm where you would start working on leadership development. And you know, part of the implicit question might be what personal skills, competencies, shifts, coaching needs to happen as well as organizationally, what what shifts, what policies, what new processes need to happen. Um, obviously, I'm going to say, you know, holacracy and maybe thinking about becoming a B corporation and, you know, using Agile and a few other things are, are good good options to use. But um, on a personal level, you're you're trying to kind of tame that CEO, that, that you know, gutsy, crazy, um, maybe egomaniac founder CEO, into something that's more needed, uh, that's more fitting for what's going on now and bringing out the best in everyone around them. Um, your, the, the empowerment problem in that sense is like, how do we empower everyone in the organization and get their autonomy and their, and their ability to engage and make choice and you know, modify roles and po- policy and you know, bring everyone's full intelligence, resourcefulness and power to bear. And that means on the corollary end of things, amping down the need and demand um, for these, you know, heroic CEOs, executives, directors, right? And and that leads to a much more distributed, decentralized, not just scalable organization, but more resilient, more adaptable, and, and harder to destroy organization uh, versus a very centralized organization that needs this, you know, the myth would be needs this magic hero, but really it's almost like the tension, like, please need me, please, I've designed this organization to depend on me. Does that, does that sound very healthy? You know, I've designed this organization. I've designed this group of fifty people to to need me. You can't possibly get rid of me. Um, so the way some people would approach this problem is saying like, um, many of you probably heard the notion of working in versus on the business, right? The more you can get the CEO or the executive types to the point where they're working on the business, on what's going to happen in the future next, or what future transformations might happen, and not the kind of in work of needing to do the daily operations. Um, that's when new new things, new new growth, new opportunities can happen, right? And versus if you are needed to work in the business all the time, you're also irreplaceable and yet nothing new is happening. Um, you're trying to kind of liberate them from from needing them, which also then frees them frees them up, frees these executives up to say, okay, so what what could happen in the future? Um, that actually relates to, I mean, the four most common competencies, when you think about what they, what people want in an executive, or that they want integrity, right? That's about ethics, getting people, not so much influ- influencing people, but um, showing that you have good professional decorum, you make good, fair, ethical decisions, right? You, you operate with, um, you could think of it as justice or, or ethics on your side, right? You With good integrity. Second, that you're competent, that you have a good degree of competency in what you're doing. You're not you're not incompetent. You're not just there for some bad reason or um, you know a mishire or something like that. Um, and the last two are kind of related, but it's about being future facing as well as being able to inspire people, right? Um, so the future facing piece is about new strategy trying to figure out what's coming next and the role we're going to play. Um, this would, you know, formally, if you study this, this would be about how you generate competitive advantage. But, but then the inspiration piece, the being able to inspire others is to say, okay, well, look, I've come up with this, you know, crazy great vision. vision and don't, um, don't you see how this fits with you? Don't you see how, um, you know, we can all take part in this in some way in trying to bring out the best and the passion. Uh, you know, the magic word in a lot of these videos has been engagement, right? Um, that helps bring that strategy to light. Um, so back to this, the, the founder CEO has a hard time letting go of power. You can see at some point, if they have a need for power, that might compromise, well, it could probably compromise all of these, but uh, one, the integrity piece, they're, they become maybe ever more biased or self-serving in their decisions, right? And the inspiration piece, if they don't have... A legitimate role for others because they need to constantly make so much dependency on them it's like everyone else is being underutilized and they're they're falling into the bias of their own like hero myth right about themselves so bad so bad no not helpful not helping anyone that also probably means if you think of that as like 
varying degrees of ignorance or deludedness, you know, delusional thinking. Um, that means that their capacity for forward thinking for that new strategy um, might get compromised because they're not seeing reality clearly or they're seeing it through a very strong you know, filtered lens, if you will. And so the, the ability to truly read what's going on in the situation around them and, and you know, pick out those trends which are going to help them renew, boost their competitive advantage, they're, it's going to be hard to do that because they're, they're basically less in touch with reality. Um, and the competency thing, yeah, they're, they may not be learning and growing the way that they need to, or at least working on their gap areas, P particularly if you include in competency the kind of management and le le leadership development that they're going to have to go through as an executive for no longer willing to lean into that process. You know, their, their time might be done. Their organizational value that they add might be pretty limited at this point. Anyway, there is... Uh, there is hope for this. It doesn't mean that you have to get rid of your leaders, um, but there is this kind of transform or die uh, piece here. Well, you know, now that you're this size of the organization, this type of organization, how can you bring the best out of everyone and not succumb to your own hero myth and you know maybe not the best parts of yourself about trying to make people depend on you? And there is a path forward. So I guess on a personal level, you you might think, well, what is that? Um, I'd like your thoughts around all of this. If any of you startup founders can relate to these these feelings and issues, or people in your organization are, are you know are dealing with these things, these are important stuff. Um, we want we want to bring the best out of people, and um, the notion then that not just one individual at their best, but team uh, a team or teams of teams of people at their best. I for, it's just magic to me that that is an option, uh, that that is a possibility, and so I, I really love to. to see and feel organizations just um uh, yeah we're all empowered and engaged and at such a great level i'm bobby ogilvy project manager and professional coach talk to you guys soon